Assalamu alaikum. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Hello, good evening. Hello, welcome to this uh, free webinar from MedExam Expert. Uh, I'm Dr. Mohamed Helmi, uh, part one MRCG course uh, mentor and MedExam Expert. Today, inshallah, uh, we are going to talk about one of the important guidelines uh, for part one and part two MRCG exam, which is uh, epilepsy and pregnancy. Of course, I'm so happy to have you with us today. Uh, also, I hope you enjoyed the last webinar about uh, uh, the endometrial hyperplasia. And uh, uh, today, inshallah, is another important guideline. And as I said in the last webinar, the percentage of the applied questions or the practical questions and the clinical management scenarios are increasing now in the part one MRCG exam. So uh, uh, it's not uh, only about basic science, but now also we have to know some important applied points and applied guidelines. Uh, uh, and from these important scenarios are the scenarios re related to management of epilepsy and pregnancy and postpartum. Especially that part related to the pharmacology or the drugs used for treating epilepsy in pregnancy. So this topic is so important and we are going to illustrate the main points of this guideline. So maybe this session will be a little bit longer than the previous one, the endometrial hyperplasia, but I hope you enjoy it, inshallah. Of course, in this session, we rely on the Green Top Guideline number 68, which was updated on June 2016. This will be our reference for today's session. And as I used to do in any session, I prefer to put the outlines, an overview over the points I'm going to talk about today. So we are going to start with a quick introduction and talking about the epidemiology and risks of epilepsy. Then how to diagnose epilepsy and pregnancy, how to assess the condition. After that, we are going to talk about the pure basic science part, the pharmacology part, the anti-epileptic drugs, their types and side effects, and then how to manage the case, pre-pregnancy, antipartum, intrapartum, and postpartum. And the last point will be the contraception and epilepsy, what to be used and what not to be used for the woman with epilepsy. So this is the outline of today's session. Let's start with the epidemiology of the condition and its risks. Of course, epilepsy are a heterogeneous group of brain diseases with the common feature of seizure. So in epilepsy, of course, the main feature is seizure and epilepsy is considered one of the most common neurological conditions in pregnancy and its prevalence is ranging from 0.5 to 1%. And even that we can estimate that there are 2,500 2, infants are born to women with epilepsy every year in the United Kingdom. So it's one of the most common neurological conditions and its prevalence is 0.5 to 1%. And one third of women with epilepsy, of course, the abbreviation WWE is women with epilepsy and this is the abbreviation mentioned in the guideline. One third of these women are in the reproductive age group and the risk of death is increased tenfold in pregnant women with epilepsy compared with those without the condition. So that's a serious rate of course and that's why it's very important to know how to manage these conditions very well. 
not only the risk on the mother, but of course, there are many risks on the fetus due to the anti-epileptic drugs, the risk of major congenital malformation, especially when increasing the number of drugs and increasing their doses, exposure to the anti-epileptic drugs in the preconception period can lead to congenital fetal malformations. And also, exposure to these anti-epileptic drugs, especially one of these very common and famous drugs, the sodium valproate, can have an adverse effect not only on the fetal formation, but also on the future neurodevelopment of the newborn in the long term. So, taking the anti-epileptic drugs can have an impact on the fetuses and the neurodevelopment of the newborn later on. A very important point that the women with epilepsy, when they are getting pregnant, they have many concerns regarding the effect of these drugs on their babies. So they might discontinue the drug by themselves without any consultation or reduce the dose. That can lead to increase the woman's risk of scissors and what's called the sudden unexpected deaths in epilepsy. We are going to define this condition in a while. So these maternal concerns lead to discontinuation or reduction of the dose of, that, of these drugs, thereby increasing these risks of having deteriorated scissors in pregnancy. And of course, the scissor deterioration and the anti-epileptic drug exposure in pregnancy have a bad impact on the life of the mother. So we have a prevalence of 0.5 to 1%. It's one of the most common neurological problems. The problem is that the rate of death in women with epilepsy is tenfold more than those without the condition. Also, the anti-epileptic drugs, if taken in the preconception period, they might, it might have a bad effect on the fetal formation and the new development of the newborn later on. And also the maternal concern regarding these side effects can lead to discontinuation or reduction of the dose of the drugs, thereby increasing the woman's risk of scissors or fits and leading to what's called the sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. So all these serious implications of this condition can, of course, affect the quality of the life of the pregnant mother. And that's why we have to know well, how to deal with such cases, especially that they are very common and we see it a lot in our practice. Am I clear so far? Yes, sir. Fine. Okay, so the second point we are going to talk about how to assess the condition in pregnancy. The diagnosis of epilepsy and epileptiform scissors should be made by a medical practitioner with expertise in epilepsy and usually a neurologist should be involved with in that diagnosis. So of course, when we talk about any medical condition in pregnancy, we have or we should have a multidisciplinary team with a specialist in that medical condition and, of course, the obstetrician. So, of course, we need a neurologist in that team. The assessment of the condition in pregnancy should include the duration and the severity, the frequency and types of scissors, the impact of epilepsy on the mother, such as driving accidents, family life, a drug history, of the effective and ineffective drugs, including history of adverse effects. So when you assess the condition, you have to 
ask about the types, the frequencies, the duration of the scissors, this, the, the, impact, the impact of the condition on the mother's life, driving, accidents, family life, employment, and what are the drugs she takes, those effective, those, those ineffective medications, and the history of any adverse effects from these drugs. Uh, some uh, participants uh, are, of course, uh, uh, listening to the session from the Facebook Live. So uh, I might miss some questions from the Facebook Live questions, so I'm going to answer them immediately after the session. This session is, of course, we are talking about the guidelines of epilepsy, so it will be beneficial for those having part one and part two exams. So, of course, uh, 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 part two candidates also are uh, uh, most welcome in the session. So uh, it will be beneficial for part one and part two, inshallah. When we assess the condition, we have to know very important point that those women who have remained scissor free for at least 10 years, with the last five years of the anti-epileptic drugs, and those who had only childhood epilepsy syndrome who have reached the adulthood period scissor and treatment free are considered no longer to have epilepsy. Those women can be managed as low risk individuals in pregnancy if there are no other risk factors. So those who are free of scissors 10 years and of the anti-epileptic drugs for five years and those with the childhood epilepsy syndrome who reached the adulthood period without scissors and treatment free, they are considered no longer to have epilepsy, they are considered low-risk individuals in their pregnancy. That's a very important point to put in our mind when we assess such condition. Imaging, of course, modalities such as MRI, CT scans are considered safe in pregnancy to assess women presenting with scissors because sometimes scissors are due to other brain other neurological conditions, not only epilepsy. So we might use such modalities like MRI and CT. They are considered safe in pregnancy because the risk to the fetus from a single exposure is very minimal. So no risk to the fetus from such imaging modalities. Classification of epilepsy or types of epilepsy is important to choose the appropriate anti-epileptic drug to determine the prognosis in pregnancy and to identify and prevent the factors or the risk factors of scissor deterioration. Talking about the types of epilepsy, of course, maybe this part is not important to know much details about the types of epilepsy because it's not the scope of our speciality as obstetricians. That's the main uh, uh, task of the neurologist to determine the type and the appropriate treatment of the type. But generally speaking, we have four types or four main types. The most serious of these types, it's called the tonic colonic scissors, which was previously known as the grand mal epilepsy, the grand mal epilepsy. These are the tonic colonic scissors, characterized by bilateral stiffening and jerking, and after the scissor state of confusion and slippiness. The problem with the tonic colonic scissors that they cause sudden loss of consciousness with uncontrolled fall without any prior warnings, which lead to accidents and also could be associated with considerable period of fetal hypoxia. The most important point to know here that this type of epilepsy is associated with the highest risk of sudden unexpected deaths in epilepsy. That's a very important exam question. Tonic colonic scissors is the type associated with the highest risk of sudden unexpected death. The second type is called the absence scissors. It's just brief periods of blank spells, unresponsiveness, then followed by rapid recovery. So they are just brief periods of unresponsiveness and followed by rapid recovery. But 
if there are worsening of absence scissors, if they are prolonged, they are repetitive, that's put the woman in high risk to progress to ton tonic colonic scissors. The second, or sorry, the third one is the juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. It's just myoclonic jerks in parts of the body, limb, for example, unpredictable movement. This can occur after sleep deprivation, after periods of stress, which lead to drop of objects from the uh, mother or from the woman. So if she is nursing a baby, she might drop her baby from her hands. So this can lead to some accidents to the baby. That's the juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. The last one is what's called the focal scissors. They are variable symptoms. They can be preceded by aura and they may be associated with impaired consciousness. If they are associated with impaired consciousness, they may lead to also some accidents, fall, fracture, burns, and so on. So these are the main types of epilepsy or scissors. The most important or the most risky is the tonic colonic one, which can lead to sudden unexpected deaths in epilepsy. So this statement is very important. Actually, it contains two important information, two important questions in the exam. The first one is that uncontrolled tonic colonic scissors are the strongest risk factor for sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. The second information is that sudden unexpected death in epilepsy is the main cause of death in pregnant women with epilepsy. What's the sudden unexpected death? It's sudden, unexpected, witnessed or not, non-traumatic, non-drowning, may be preceded or may be not preceded by scissor, without documented status epilepticus, and in which post-mortem examination does not reveal any toxicologic or anatomic cause of this. So we can summarize this statement or this definition that it's sudden unexpected death without any cause, without any cause, without trauma, without drowning, without any toxicologic or anatomic cause, may be preceded or may be not preceded by scissors. That's the sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. And of course, a very important part of the assessment is to know the differential diagnosis because not all cases presenting with scissors are epilepsy. The most famous cause of epilepsy uh, sorry, scissors or fits in pregnancy is eclampsia. Of course, usually presenting in the second half of pregnancy. And if the fits or the woman presenting by fits cannot be clearly, clearly confirmed as having epilepsy, so we should give immediate treatment as it's a case of eclampsia until we reach a definitive diagnosis. So if you have a case in the emergency and it's presented to you with fits, especially if it's if she's coming in the second half of pregnancy and there is no history of previous scissors or fits. So we have to manage this case as eclampsia until reaching a definitive diagnosis. Of course, we are going to treat with magnesium sulfate. There are also different various causes for fits or scissors in pregnancy like cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. One of the neurological pathologies or lesions called the posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome, space occupying lesions, reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome, syncope, which is associated with many cardiac conditions like cardiac arrhythmias, aortic stenosis, carotid sinus sensitivity, vasovagal syncope, all of these Syncopal attacks could be put in the differential diagnosis. Also metabolic conditions like hypoglycemia, hyponatremia, Edisonian crisis, and also another important condition to be put in our mind, which, which is called the non-epileptic attack disorder. 
This is some sort of psychogenic non-epileptic scissors can be found in those women having dissociation, one of the mental problems. It's not caused by epileptic, epileptic form discharge from the brain. It's something just psychological etiology. But the problem is that that non-epileptic attack disorder, or which is called psychogenic non-epileptic scissors, co can coexist with epilepsy. That can pose some complex diagnostic challenges and requires a multidisciplinary management with access to psychiatric team. So also maybe the scissors could origin, originate from just a psychological problem. So clear all the previous parts? Is there any question? No, thank you. No, thank you. Okay. So what about the anti-epileptic drugs? That's part related to the basic science, the pharmacology part. First, we have to know that anti-epileptic drugs are classified, or we can classify them broadly, into enzyme-inducing anti-epileptic drugs and non-enzyme-inducing anti-epileptic drugs. Do you know what's meant by enzyme-inducing? No, sir. Okay, enzyme-inducing drugs, these kind of drugs stimulate the, metab the metabolizing enzymes or the microsomal enzymes of the liver, increasing the metabolism of other drugs. So giving such drugs may reduce the efficacy of other drugs because they increase their metabolism. From the enzyme-inducing drugs, the most famous, the carpamazepine, the phenytoin, phenoparpital, and the topiramate, those with the bold bond, the carpamazepine, the phenytoin, the phenoparpital, topiramate. These are the most famous. The non-enzyme inducing, they don't have any effect on the liver metabolizing enzymes. The sodium valproate, the levetiracetam, the gabapentin. That's the most famous of such category. Drugs of epilepsy are associated with increased teratogenicity. They could cause any form of teratogenicity like neural tube defects, cleft lip and palate, cardiac defects, urogenital, neonatal, trigulopathies, and skeletal abnormalities. Of course, this will depend upon the type of the drug, the dose, if the woman is taking monotherapy or polytherapy or polypharmacy. So this, of course, these factors will, you know, have its influence on this risk of teratogenicity. Of course, the risk of recurrence for major congenital malformation is increased in those women if they have a previous child with major congenital malformation. So if a woman with epilepsy who is taking anti-epileptic drug had one child with congenital malformation, the risk of recurrence is high in the subsequent pregnancies. The first drug, the sodium valproate, has the worst teratogenic profile. The worst teratogenic profile. This is a very important exam question. Not only doing congenital malformations like cardiac, craniofacial, urogenital, limb defects, but also can lead to long-term neurodevelopment uh, 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 impact, have an, an adverse impact on the long-term neuro neurodevelopment of the newborn, and also affect the IQ, the performance IQ, and when studies were done, those children exposed to sodium valproate had lower intelligent quotient compared with women without epilepsy and those women not taking anti-epileptic drugs. And also it increased the rate of childhood autism. So sodium valproate has the worst teratogenic profile. The phenytoin is associated with malformation because it affects the folate metabolism. Collectively, they are called the fetal anticonvulsant syndrome, which consists of cleft lip and palate, microcephaly, 
cardiac abnormalities and mental retardation, but usually phenytoin is not associated with neural tube defects. The third drug, the carpamazepin, is considered the safest in pregnancy. Yes, it can cause similar effects to phenytoin plus neural tube defects, but these risks are very rare. So carpamazepin are considered the safest in pregnancy. And according to the green top guideline, we can summarize these effects. Sodium valproate is usually associated with neural tube defects, facial cleft, and hypospadias. Phenoparfitel and phenytoin are associated with cardiac malformations, and phenytoin and carpamazepin are associated with cleft palate in the fetus. So these are the most concerning and most important congenital malformations associated with these drugs. The benzodiazepines, or we are talking about mainly the diazepam, they are positive stimulator of the GABA receptors. Usually they are used to treat status epilepticus and also to treat the epileptic scissors during labor. And status epilepticus is defined at 30 minutes of continual scissor activity or a cluster of scissors without recovery. And of course, this is also a very fatal condition. It should be treated very fast. The antidote of diazepam is called flumazenil, and also this is a very important information. And another important point that diazepam is highly lipid soluble. That's why it can cross the blood brain barrier and the placenta, and also it's excreted into the pressed milk. The most common adverse effect of benzodiazepines is called the neonatal benzodiazepine with the drawal syndrome or the floppy infant syndrome, it's the same, okay? Especially when taken in the third trimester. You find that there is a, a hypotonia of the neonate, you know, failure to uh, suckle and uh, the responsiveness or the upgrade score of the neonate will be low. This is called the neonatal benzodiazepine withdrawal syndrome or the floppy infant syndrome. And for those who are studying from, I think, uh, the Oxford Revision Notes, I think there is a mistake. They, it's written that the floppy infant syndrome is associated with phenytoin, and that's a wrong information. The floppy infant syndrome is the same as neonatal benzodiazepine withdrawal syndrome. It's one of the common side effects of the benzodiazepines or the diazepam mainly. Clear? Yeah. Okay. Yes, also, there are the newer classes of antiepileptic drugs. The most famous of those drugs is the lamotrigine. And the lamotrigine, by the way, also is a non-enzyme-inducing drug. Non-enzyme-inducing. It's considered safe in pregnancy. But other new classes or newer uh, drugs, like topiramate, gabapentin, levetiracetam, the problem with such drugs is that they don't have firm information in pregnancy to guide risk assessment. So it's, of course, uh, 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 preferred to avoid such new drugs because we don't know uh, their uh, effect in pregnancy. We don't have good studies about them in pregnancy. And that's a rule. When you give any drug in pregnancy, not only anti-epileptic drugs, that you usually try to use the old, well-known drugs, avoid the new drugs, with, which is uh, lack strong studies or firm studies in pregnancy. Among the anti-epileptic drugs, that's also a very important st statement in the Green Top Guideline, that the lamotrigine and the carpamazepine monotherapy at lower doses have the least risk of major congenital malformation in the offspring. So we can say that lamotrigine and the carpamazepine are considered the drugs of the least risk. Also, exposing the fetus to these drugs doesn't appear to have an adverse effect on the neurodevelopment of the offspring. So those mothers taking lamotrigine and carpamazepine, they should be assured that these drugs have the least risk of congenital malformations and also 
the long-term neural development. Now, let's talk about management of a case of epilepsy or how to approach such a case. And of course, we are going to divide this part of the management into four parts, pre-pregnancy, antepartum, intrapartum, and postpartum. Pre-pregnancy, those women with epilepsy seeking pregnancy. Of course, when we are talking about the pre-pregnancy period, so we are talking about two important things. How to counsel those women and how to minimize the risks before they got pregnant. So women who are planning their pregnancy, of course, should seek a clinician competent in the management of epilepsy, who will take the responsibility for sharing decision around choice, do this of the anti-epileptic drugs based on the risk to the fetus and the control of the scissors. And that's the challenge here when we are dealing with a case with epilepsy. How to make a balance in choosing the drug, the type of the drug and the dose of the drug to make this balance between the scissors, how to control the scissors and the risk to the fetus. So we are going to try as much as we can to reduce the number of the drugs, the dose of the drug to decrease the risk on the fetus. But in the same time, this type of the drug and that dose should give us a good control of such scissors. Because of course, it's not accepted to reduce the risk on the fetus and put much risk on the mother of having deterioration of her condition or her scissors. So that's the challenge here. So what information we should give to such cases, such women? They should be informed about many points. The first one is that most mothers have normal healthy babies. So the risk of such congenital malformations are low, especially if these women are not exposed to anti-epileptic drugs in the preconception period. Because some women who had history or previous history of epilepsy, but now they are free, they stopped their treatment, they, had, they have some concerns that epilepsy per se or itself could lead to uh, uh, problems in the fetus. We have to counsel them that epilepsy itself will not lead to congenital malformation, especially that if they are not exposed to the anti-epileptic drugs in the preconception period. And if they are not exposed, the risk of congenital malformation is nearly similar to the background population. Also, we have to inform them that this risk is dependent on the type, number, and dose of anti-epileptic drugs. And also, they should be counseled and given written information on the risk of self-discontinuation of the anti-epileptic drugs and the effect of scissors and these drugs on the fetus, on pregnancy, breastfeeding, and even contraception. They should know all the information throughout the pregnancy and even postpartum and also about contraception. Because these women really have much concern in their minds about the future of their pregnancy. So they need to predict the scenario. So you have to counsel them about every point from starting the pregnancy until taking even contraception after pregnancy. Also, you have to inform these women that two thirds of women will not have scissor deterioration in pregnancy. And we don't have any test to predict the risk of scissor deterioration. The only and the most important factor in assessing this point is the scissor free duration. So the longer the woman having a scissor free duration, the better the prognosis and the better 
the condition and you are, can assure her that or reassure her that she will not have scissor deterioration in pregnancy. But those who had experienced scissors in the year prior to conception, those women require very close monitoring because they are at risk of scissor deterioration in pregnancy. Clear? Yes, sir. Okay. Also, you have to counsel them to inform them about the prenatal screening for congenital malformation. And also, you have to inform them that we are going to give them few safety precautions to significantly reduce the risk of accidents and minimize the anxiety. We are going to talk about these safety precautions when addressing the postpartum management. So, these are the main points we should counsel the woman about. Also, any healthcare professional when dealing with a woman with epilepsy should acknowledge the concerns of such women and be aware that these concerns might affect their adherence and compliance to the anti-epileptic drugs. So, you have to listen to all these concerns and to give these women all this important information and to make sure that they will continue having their drugs to have a good control and on their fits and on their scissors. Because these women tend to overestimate these risks of teratogenicity associated with taking the anti-epileptic drugs. And of course, this risk perception and this overestimation will of course adversely affect their compliance and their adherence on such drugs. And it's very dangerous that these women could stop the drug abruptly or lower the dose. So this can uh, you know, lead to deterioration of the condition and she might progress to a, a very fatal condition such as status epilepticus or even sudden unexpected death. And how to minimize the risk? The only thing I think we have is just to offer them five milligrams per day of folic acid prior to conception and until at least the end of the first trimester. And of course, we can also reduce the dose of the anti-epileptic drug, but this is of course according to the uh, uh, neurologist opinion. We have to give the lowest effective dose of the most appropriate anti-epileptic drug. This is, of course, not the decision of the obstetrician, it's the decision of the neurologist. And if she's taking polytherapy or the very dangerous drug, the sodium valproate, this, the risk could be minimized by changing such drugs. And I said, after recommended by an, an epilepsy specialist, but if there is a risk of maternal scissor deterioration from changing the type of the anti-epileptic drug. So she should be advised to continue on the sodium valproate or on the polytherapy, whatever she is taking. But of course, the health of the mother matters first. She should be our first priority. We should have a good control on the, the scissors. And after that, we think about the fetus. So if there is a risk of maternal scissor deterioration from changing the anti-epileptic drug, women will need to be advised to continue the sodium valproate or the anti-epileptic drug polytherapy. What about antipartum management after getting pregnant? The lady, of course, will have a very special antenatal care plan. Also, in this part, we are going to address many important points. The obstetric complications and the adverse effect of the anti-epileptic drugs, monitoring the woman taking anti-epileptic drugs, how to monitor them. What about the anomaly scan and the fetal monitoring, the optimal timing and mode of delivery, and if the case is non-epileptic attack disorder, how to deal with her. So these are the main points in the antipartum management. 
For the antenatal care plan, it should be arranged by a multidisciplinary team, as mentioned before. This team contains an obstetrician, and it's preferred that this obstetrician has a special interest in epilepsy, a neurologist specialized in training with epilepsy cases, neuropsychiatrist may be involved with, and a midwife. This is called the epilepsy care team. And of course, it's never, it's a very important st statement, it's never recommended to stop or change anti-epileptic drugs abruptly without an informed discussion. So if we have this multidisciplinary team, any woman who had who have epilepsy and taking anti-epileptic drug, when becoming pregnant, she should be able to contact this team and to have a very detailed discussion and the First point to tell her is that never to stop the drug abruptly. And of course, according to the advice of the neurologist, she can lower the dose, she can change the drug as related to her condition. What are the obstetric complications in women with epilepsy and what are the adverse effects of the anti-epileptic drugs regarding the mother, of course, we are talking now about the mother. So these drugs, can have some adverse effects on the mother herself, can lead to depression, low mood, inability to plan and organize, poor concentration, irritability, and anxiety, could have some neuropsychiatric symptoms, also may lead to some psychosocial problems, low esteem, fear of having scissors, scissors. all this can have a negative impact on the quality of life of the mother. So also we have to give her an access to a perinatal mental health team if there are any concerns about her mental state, about her cognitive function, about the memory, about the mood. So also these mothers should have an access to a perinatal mental health team to address such adverse effects of the anti-epileptic drugs. Also, according to different studies, it was found that there are some increase of some obstetric complications regarding or in women with epilepsy, like spontaneous miscarriage, antepartum hemorrhage, hypertensive disorders, the rate of induction of labor and cesarean section, preterm delivery, fetal growth restriction, and also the rate of postpartum hemorrhage. You know, these are according to many, many and various studies. Some studies say, for example, that there is increase in the rate of miscarriage, hypertensive disorders, but no increase in the preterm delivery or fetal growth restriction. But another study say that the rate of preterm delivery and fetal growth restriction are increased and so on. So these are the combinations of various studies. Some say that some of these complications increase, others say no, but collectively we can say all these obstetric complications might increase in epilepsy, even without taking anti-epileptic drugs. How to monitor those women taking anti-epileptic drugs? They should be regularly assessed for the risk factors for scissors like fasting, sleep deprivation, stress. All these risk factors can lead to deterioration of scissors. They should be monitored about their adherence to the drug, the scissor types, frequency, the mother will being, any symptoms like tiredness and dizziness, all these symptoms and all these factors should be regularly assessed during the antenatal care period. And for the drugs, it's known that due to the changes in pregnancy, the physiological changes in the pregnancy, the changes in the pharmacokinetics and pharma pharmacodynamics, the levels of most anti-epileptic drugs are known to fall in pregnancy. For example, the level of lamotrigine, for example, are is known to fall by about 70% in pregnancy. So in many cases, the neurologists see that the women with epilepsy need to increase their dose of the anti-epileptic drugs to make a good control on the scissors. And when we monitor such drugs, we have two methods. We can do the regular therapeutic drug monitoring by measuring the drug level in the serum or monitoring based on the clinical features. We just monitor the clinical features 
if we have signs of you know increasing the frequency of uh, myoclonic jerks scissors we may increase the dose if we have increase in the toxicity signs we low we lower the dose so this is monitoring based on clinical features the other one is based on measuring the serum level of the drug which method to use in pregnancy according to the current evidence there is no difference between both methods and actually it's not recommended to measure the serum levels of the anti-epileptic drugs because just monitoring by clinical features is enough and there is no clear evidence to show that therapeutic drug monitoring reduced the risk of scissor deterioration compared with, with monitoring based on clinical features. Of course, in some special conditions, if you suspect that this woman is not taking the drug, if there are some signs of toxicity, if there are intractable scissors, at such conditions, you may need to do therapeutic drug monitoring by measuring the serum levels. But generally speaking, there is no difference between the two methods. And most of the evidence state that we can just monitor the, the drug level by just uh, monitoring the clinical uh, features or the clinical uh, uh, picture. Clear? Yes, yeah, sir. Okay. Regarding the anomaly scan and fetal monitoring, of course, usually we do the routine fetal anomaly scan from 18 to 20 plus six weeks of gestation, which can identify the major cardiac defects and also the neural tube defects. And also we need to do serial growth scans are required for detection of small or gestational age babies. And because that's considered the most concerning obstetric complication with epilepsy, small for gestational age babies, but there is no rule for the routine antepartum fetal surveillance with CTG. So we will do the anomaly scan between 18 and 20 plus six weeks and serial growth scans to exclude small or gestational age babies. For the timing and mode of delivery, no need for stating certain you know, gestational age for delivery because most of the women will have uncomplicated pregnancy and uncomplicated labor, and the diagnosis of epilepsy per se is not an indication for planned cesarean section or induction of labor, except those small proportion of women with significant deterioration of scissors or experienced status epilepticus, we can consider elective cesarean section or early delivery if they have deterioration of their condition. And for those women taking enzyme-inducing anti-epileptic drugs who are at risk of preterm delivery, doubling the antenatal corticosteroid dose is not recommended. No need to increase or double the dose of the antenatal corticosteroid, even if the woman is taking enzyme-inducing drug and is, risk, is at risk of having preterm delivery. So it's not recommended. As I said before, one of the conditions to be put in mind is the woman with non-epileptic attack disorder or the psychogenic scissors. Sometimes they receive an appropriate medical intervention and also iatrogenic early delivery, which is not recommended. So we have to reach a firm diagnosis. And of course, if we suspect the non-epileptic attack disorder, we have uh, uh, to consult a specialist psychiatric or psychological service. So for the antepartum management, to summarize the most important points regarding the antepartum management, the antenatal care with the multidisciplinary epilepsy team, routine monitoring of the serum anti-epileptic drug levels is not recommended, although individual circumstances may be considered, the fetal anomaly scan is important between 18 and 20 plus six weeks to identify major cardiac anomalies and neural tube defects. The diagnosis of epilepsy per se is not an indication for planned cesarean section or induction of labor. 
and those women taking enzyme-inducing anti-epileptic drugs and at risk of preterm de delivery, doubling of the antenatal corticosteroid dose is not recommended. So these are the main highlights and the most important points regarding the antepartum management. Am I clear so far? Clear. Yes. Excellent. Yes. Okay. For the intrapartum management, what are the points to address in the intrapartum management? First, what are the risks and the risk factors for scissors in labor and how to minimize them? And what if a case have an epileptic scissors in labor, how to manage this case? What are the recommended methods of analgesia in labor for women with epilepsy and other considerations like induction of labor and the place of delivery? So these are the main points of the intrapartum management. Pregnant women with epilepsy should be counseled that the risk of scissor in labor is low. It's reported that occurrence of scissors is Three in, in 3.5 percent of women with epilepsy in labor, and tonic colonic scissors occur in about one to two percent, and within 24 hours of delivery in a further one to two percent. So generally speaking, the risk of scissor in labor is low, especially if we are taking the prophylactic measures to reduce the risk factors. The problem with the scissors in labor is that they can lead to maternal hypoxia due to the apnea associated with the scissors and as a consequence, it can lead to fetal hypoxia and acidosis, especially if it's associated with uterine hypertonus or uterine hyperstimulation. That's why we should be careful during labor and try to avoid such triggering factors for scissors, and we have to minimize such risk. What are the risk factors? Of course, in labor, it's a matter of stress. Also, if labor is prolonged, it may associated with dehydration, insomnia, pain and tiredness, and also some cases don't take the drug during labor, so the non-intake also of the anti-epileptic drug may be a risk factor for scissor in labor. So this risk factors should be avoided. So to minimize such risks, we have to give adequate analgesia and adequate care, adequate hydration, and avoid such factors like insomnia, stress, and dehydration to provide the maximum safety. Long-acting benzodiazepines, such as the clopazam, can be considered if there is a very high risk of scissor in the peripartum period. We can give such drug, the long-acting benzodiazepine, clopazam, if the woman is at considered high risk of scissors in labor. Those who had a recent convulsive scissor, those who had a recent history of scissor provocation by stress or sleep deprivation, or those who had a history of scissor in previous labors. Those cases are considered high risk, so we can give them long-acting benzodiazepines like clopazam as prophylaxis. And the problem with benzodiazepines, as mentioned before, it can lead to respiratory depression in the newborn and the benzodiazepine withdrawal syndrome. The third point is to make sure that the anti-epileptic drug should be continued during labor. And if this cannot be tolerated orally, you can give them as a parenteral route, like phenytoin, phenoparpital, sodium valproate, and levetiracetam. All these drugs could, could be given parenterally. So if the woman cannot take the drug orally, you can give a parenteral alternative. So these are the points to how to minimize the risk of scissors in labor. But if the case now develop an epileptic scissor in labor, how to manage? First of all, any obstetric unit, any hospital should have written guidelines on how to manage scissor in labor. Those scissors should be terminated as soon as possible to avoid maternal and fetal hypoxia. And any scissor lasting more than five minutes, and especially if it's repeated, this can progress to status epilepticus 
and this is a life-threatening medical emergency. So scissors and labor should be terminated as soon as possible to avoid the fatal condition status epilepticus and also to avoid fetal hypoxia and fetal acidosis. If any woman with epilepsy develop epileptic scissors and labor, you have to put her in the left lateral position to maintain the airway and oxygenation and to give the drugs of a choice to terminate the scissor, which are the benzodiazepines. We can give as a first choice, the lorazepam as intravenous dose. If it's not found, we can give diazepam as an alternative. If there is no intravenous axis, you can give diazepam rectally or midazolam as a buccal preparation. So we start by the intravenous drugs, the lorazepam. If it's not found, we can give diazepam. If there is no intravenous axis, you can give diazepam rectally or midazolam as a buccal preparation. If the scissors are not controlled after giving the benzodiazepines, you can consider administration of phenytoin or phosphenytoin. Of course, during the attack of scissor, you have to do continuous fetal monitoring, especially after recovery, because sometimes the epileptic scissors are associated with decline in the fetal heart rate. If the fetal heart rate not begin to recover within five minutes, or if the scissors are recurrent, you have to expedite delivery. You have to fasten the delivery, and this may need even to do an urgent cesarean section if vaginal delivery is not imminent. And also, if there is persistent uterine hypertonus, you could uh, give to colitic agent. And of course, you have to inform the neonatal team, especially if you give benzodiazepines because of the risk of the neonatal withdrawal syndrome. So again, a woman developed an epileptic scissor in labor. You have to put her in the left lateral tilt and you should maintain the airway. And you have to give Benzodiazepines to terminate this scissor. If not controlled, you can give phenytoin or phosphenytoin. And you have to do fetal monitoring. And if the fetal heart rate is not recovered after or within five minutes of the scissor termination, you have to consider expediting birth. And also, if there is uterine hypertonus, you have to give a tocolytic agent and then inform the neonatal team due to the risk of the neonatal withdrawal syndrome. Clear? Clear, sir. Okay, fine. What are the recommended methods of analgesia in labor for women with epilepsy? The preferred methods are giving the entonox, which is nitrous oxide and oxygen, or to give regional analgesia like epidural spinal or TENS, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, and it's preferred to consider an epidural analgesia early to minimize the precipitating factors of scissors like overbreathing, sleep deprivation, pain, emotional stress. So when you give adequate analgesia from the start, this will, of course, minimize the precipitating factors of scissors. It's preferred to avoid pethidin or to give it with very uh, uh, cautions in women with epilepsy because it's epileptogenic, because it's metabolized to norepithidine. It's epileptogenic and can uh, uh, reduce the threshold of scissors in such women, especially if, of course, these patients have normal renal functions, the metabolism is high, so it can lead to uh, uh, scissors. So it's better to avoid pethidine. If you need to give uh, uh, any of the opiates, you can give diamorphine instead. Also, if you are going to give general anesthesia, it's preferred to avoid agents such as the pethidine, ketamine, and sevoflurane because all of them also are epileptogenic and they lower the scissor threshold. There are no known contraindications to any of the induction agents uh, in women with epilepsy. And of course, 
any woman with epilepsy at risk of peripartum scissor should be or should have her delivery in a consultant led unit with facilities for one to one with midwifery care and maternal and neonatal resuscitation. Of course, continuous electronic fetal monitoring is recommended in these mothers. And the decision to use water for analgesia and birth should be made on individual basis. Women who are free from thesers for long period, they are not taking drugs, they might be offered a water birth after discussion with their epilepsy specialist. So to summarize again, the main points of the intrapartum management, they should be counseled that the risk of thesers in labor is low, adequate hydration and pain relief are provided to minimize the risk factors for scissors like insomnia, stress, dehydration, and so on. We should counsel the woman or advise her to continue taking the drug during labor. And if it's not tolerated orally, you can give a parenteral alternative. Benzodiazepines are the drugs of choice in management of epileptic scissors in labor. Epidural should be considered early as analgesia to minimize the precipitating factors. Methadone should be used with caution as it is epileptogenic. There are no known contraindications to use of any induction agents in women with epilepsy. So that's the main points regarding the intrapartum management. Yes, sir. Here? Yes. Any question? No, sir. Okay. What about the postpartum management? We should know a few points. What are the risks for postpartum scissors and how to minimize? Reviewing the anti epileptic drugs, the newborn care, what are the safety strategies for the mother and the baby, and screening for postpartum debris. Here, we have a very important statement that women with epilepsy and their caregivers need to be aware that although the overall chance of scissors during and immediately after delivery is low, it's relatively higher than during pregnancy. So if you are asked about what is the period of the highest risk of scissors, it's the postpartum period, the postpartum period because there are exacerbation of the risk factors of scissor deterioration, like increased the stress, sleep deprivation, missed medication, and anxiety. Of course, you know, a mother with a newborn baby, she has disturbance in the sleep. She doesn't sleep very well in the night. She can miss her medication. It's a matter of anxiety. All this stressful condition will precipitate scissors. So the most dangerous period is the postpartum period. So you have to minimize also the risk factors. Women with epilepsy should be advised to continue their drugs and she should be well supported in the postnatal period to ensure that triggers of scissor deterioration such as sleep deprivation, stress, missed medication and pain are minimized. That's the most important risk key factor here, the sleep deprivation. So this could be minimized by arranging help for such mothers, especially for the nighttime feeds. If the mother is breastfeeding, she can store the breast milk, pump it, and this could be given to the baby at night by another caregiver and leaving the uh, mother to have enough sleep at night. So, this mother should be very well supported at the postpartum period. If the anti-epileptic drug dose was increased in pregnancy, it should be reviewed within 10 days of delivery to avoid postpartum toxicity. And if any symptoms of toxicity develop in the perperium, like drowsiness, diplopia, or unsteadiness, urgent neurological review is needed. That's for the mother. For the baby, all babies born to women with epilepsy taking enzyme inducing drugs should be offered one milligram of intramuscular vitamin K to prevent hemorrhagic disease of the newborn. We know these kind of drugs, the enzyme inducing drugs, competitively inhibit the precursor 
of clotting factors and affecting the microsomal enzymes of the fetus, which degrade vitamin K and increasing the risk of hemorrhagic disease of the newborn. So all these babies should, of course, receive one milligram of intramuscular vitamin K to prevent the hemorrhagic disease of the newborn. There is insufficient evidence to recommend giving the mother routine oral vitamin K to prevent hemorrhagic disease of the newborn. And also vitamin K, if given antenatally, it has no effect in lowering the risk of postpartum hemorrhage or preventing postpartum hemorrhage. So the only rule of vitamin K in epilepsy is those mother taking enzyme-inducing drug, you should give the newborn one milligram intramuscular vitamin K. And of course, the neonates born to women with epilepsy taking anti-epileptic drugs should be monitored for some adverse effects like lethargy, difficulty in feeding, excessive sedation, withdrawal symptoms, and inconsolable crying. So these are some adverse effects for such newborn exposed to anti-epileptic drug in utero. For breastfeeding, all women with epilepsy taking, even taking anti-epileptic drugs should be encouraged to breastfeed. Those amount excreted in breast milk is very low. It has no effect or adverse effect on the cognitive outcomes of the newborn. So breastfeeding should be encouraged in epilepsy. After that, we have to put safety strategies to minimize the risks to the mother and the baby. Accidents, drowning, falls, burns, electrocution. These are other concerns, not only the scissors, but the accidents which can occur after such scissors. So we have to give some safety recommendations or safety strategies to those mothers. These safety strategies include advising her to nurse the baby on the floor when she is doing something to the baby, breastfeeding, changing the clothes of the baby and so, she can sit on the floor because in case she had absence attack or scissor attack, she will not drop her baby from her hands. She should use very shallow baby bath to avoid drowning of the baby if she experiences any attack. Laying the baby down if there is any warning aura, not passing the baby unaccompanied, she should have a companion with her. She should wear identification tags if she is going in a public place. Avoid sleeping deprivation and alcohol. She should ensure that family and friends who are in close contact to her have knowledge of first aid and how to deal with epileptic attacks. Also, they should not be accommodated in single rooms unless there is continuous observation by a carer or a partner or a nursing staff. So these safety strategies should be given to the mother and she should follow them to avoid any accidents for her or for the baby. And of course, those women with epilepsy are at increased risk of depression. So we should do screening for depressive disorders in the perperium and they should be informed about such symptoms and contact details for any assistance. So again, to summarize that part of the postpartum management, we can say that the immediate postpartum period is high risk period for exacerbation of scissor frequency due to increased stress, sleep deprivation, missed medication, and anxiety, pain, and so on. If the anti-epileptic drug dose was increased in pregnancy, it should be reviewed within 10 days of delivery to avoid postpartum toxicity. All babies born to women with epilepsy taking enzyme-inducing anti-epileptic drugs should receive one milligram of intramuscular vitamin K. This to prevent hemorrhagic disease of the newborn. Women with epilepsy who are taking drugs in pregnancy should be encouraged to breastfeed. You should give her the safety strategies, the safety advice to reduce the risk of accidents and so on. And also you should do screening for depressive disorders in the perperium due to the high risk of postpartum depression in such women.
Clear? Clear, sir. Okay. okay. The last point of today's session is the contraception with epilepsy. Of course, contraception also is one of the concerns to women with epilepsy to avoid unplanned pregnancies. And contraception will depend upon the type of the drug, whether it's enzyme-inducing and or non-enzyme-inducing drug. So let's start with the problem, the enzyme-inducing drugs. Those drugs, like I said before, they stimulate the metabolizing enzymes of the liver, so they decrease the efficacy of other drugs, including some of the hormonal contraception. So when we talk about the methods of contraception, which are not affected by such enzyme-inducing drugs, they are the copper intratrine devices, the marina or the levonorgestrel releasing intratrine system, and the medroxyprogesterone acetate injections or what's called the Devoprovera. So these are the reliable methods to be given to those women taking enzyme-inducing drugs. We should counsel these women about the risk of failure or decreased efficacy with the oral contraceptives combined or progesterone only, the transdermal patches, vaginal rings, and progesterone only implants. All these forms of contraception will have high risk of failure or decreased efficacy if they are taken alongside the enzyme-inducing anti-epileptic drugs. But if a woman who is taking enzyme-inducing drug insists on using oral contraception, whether combined or progesterone-only pills, you can make some other steps or strategies to increase the efficacy of such contraceptive pills by increasing the estrogen component to 50 micrograms and reducing the pill-free interval from seven days to four days and tricycling by giving three packs back to pack and then hormone-free interval. So I'm not going to give one pack and hormone-free interval. No, you are going to give three packs and then hormone-free interval which should be reduced to only four days. And also, we can add barrier contraception, especially at the expected time of ovulation. So, barrier contraception should be additionally used. So, so this strategy should be given to the woman who insists on taking oral contraception with enzyme-inducing anti-epileptic drugs. For emergency contraception, the best choice for such women is the copper IUD. Don't give levonorgestrel or the olprestal acetate tablets or pills because they are also affected by the enzyme-inducing drugs. Lastly, what about those women taking non-enzyme-inducing? They can be offered any method of contraception. No problem with such kind of drugs, but we have concern about one drug, which is the lamotrigine. Lamotrigin itself, by itself, it's not enzyme-inducing. But it has an interaction with the estrogen-containing contraceptives. It's known that lamotrigin decreases the efficacy of any estrogen-containing contraceptive, and also estrogen-containing contraceptives decrease the efficacy of lamotrigin. So they affect each other in both directions they have adverse effects on each other. Lamotrigine decreases the efficacy of estrogen-containing contraception and also estrogen-containing contraception decreases the efficacy of lamotrigine. The mechanism is not well understood or not known, but lamotrigine itself is not enzyme-inducing. That's a very important information, by the way. And it came before in a question in the exam. And this table summarizes the United Kingdom medical, medical eligibility criteria of the different types of anti-epileptic drug and the different modalities of contraception. Just for the knowledge, of course, category or the number one refers that this method can be safely used. Number two is 
states that this the benefit of the method outweighs the risk. Number three states that the risk of the method outweighs the benefit, but it can be given if there is no available or other available methods. And type or number four is totally contraindicated. This is what's meant by the different numbers. If some of you don't know what's the UK medical eligibility criteria, and and we can see here with the enzyme inducing anti-epileptic drugs for the progesterone uh, uh, only injection, especially the Dibuprovera or the Medroxyprogesterone acetate, number one safely used the Levonorgestrel, number one safely used the copper IUD, number one safely used for the non-enzyme inducing drugs. Any method could be given, all of them taking number one. The only thing is that, or the only exception is the lamotrogen. We can see here, it takes number three with the combined hormonal method because any estrogen containing method should be avoided with lamotrogen. Clear everyone? Yes, sir. Okay. So yes, by sir. we, I've finished all the highlights, the most important points regarding this guideline. But before we finalize the session, we will go through a few questions and then I'm going to leave you with Mafia, the course coordinator and the IT specialist. She is going to talk to you about the course of part one MRCG. But before that, let's go, let's go through some questions. A female patient with well-controlled Epilepsy attends clinic for some preconception advice. Which anti-epileptic drug carries the greatest risk of neural tube defects? Sorry, yes. Yes, exactly. It's C. Answer is C. Sodium. First teratogenic profile. A 25-year-old nulliparous woman with a lifelong history of tonic colonic scissors sees her neurologist as she wishes to start a family. In addition to her current anticonvulsant therapy, which additional drug is now required? C. C. C also. Yes, the right answer is folic acid. What is the dose given here? Five milligram. Five mg. Yes. Five milligram. Usual for hundred microgram. Okay, we have which of these drugs or these agents is associated with the floppy infant syndrome? Can ben B. Yes, diazepam or any of course of the benzodiazepines will be associated with the floppy infant syndrome. You review a 17-year-old patient in clinic, she has been taking lamotrogen. For two years, last month, her GB started her on microgenon, which is one of the combined, as she started a new sexual relationship. What would your primary concern be? C. C. Reception increase the lamotrogen. No, contraception reduces the lamotrogen level and increases the risk. Yes, exactly. It's C. Combined contraceptives may reduce lamotrogen levels and increase the scissor risk. If you look at the option number one, lamotrogen is a strong enzyme inducer and may inhibit contraceptive effect. This statement will be no, it's an enzyme only if we remove this part. It's not enzyme induced. Yes, it inhibits the contraceptive effect, but with unknown mechanism. So that's why option A is wrong because some candidates before have chosen option A as the right answer, and this is of course not correct. Lamotrogen is not an enzyme induced. Yes, it inhibits contraceptive effect by a known mechanism. So the best answer here is C, combined contraceptive may reduce lamotrogen levels. Diazepam can cross the placenta due to? 
lipid soluble yes, it's highly lipid soluble that's why it cross the blood brain barrier placenta and you review a 26 year old patient in clinic she has been taking phenytoin for six years and has good scissor control at her current dose she has started a new relationship and wants contraceptive advice she doesn't mind any form of contraception but doesn't want to use barrier methods according to the uk medical eligibility criteria which of the following would be most appropriate d levonorgestrel intrauterine system why Yes, yes, it's the right answer is D. Because it's not is the enzyme inducer. Yes, phenytoin is one of the enzyme inducing drugs. So the best choice here is to give an orgestrel intra uterine system. 29 year old girl comes to the woman's sexual clinic and seeks advice for contraception. She's on sodium valproate. What would be your best advice regarding contraception? B, she can use COCP. Oh, B, it can be. So she, so she can or she can't? She or can. she can with other precautions. We have mentioned the sodium valproate. Ah, uh, yeah, E. The right answer, maybe E. Okay, so you have changed it, your answer because I just made you confused. Of course, your first answer was right. She can use contraceptive pills without any concerns. Sodium valproate is a non enzyme inducing drug. Ah, uh, yeah. So she can use any form of contraception she needs. Of course, I know that uh, it needs some time to memorize all the non-enzyme and enzyme-inducing drugs, but sodium valproate is one of the uh, non-enzyme-inducing, so any form of contraception can be given with sodium valproate. Ah, uh, yeah, it's okay. 28-year-old woman on carpamazepine for epilepsy, what is the suitable contraception? Myrina, see? Marina. Mm, Myrina, of course. Mm. That's. Amazepin is one of the enzyme inducing drugs. So, Myrina is the right answer. Myrina, yeah. Nice. I, I want to say something, by the way, because I, I have a comment on the Facebook Live that uh, for, uh, for the enzyme inducing drug, the first is uh, uh, copper IUD, the second best is Myrina. No, no. The arrangement. You know, the arrangement is just, these are options, not in, the, in, in that order, by the way. If, uh, in general, we want to select between the Mirena and the copper IUD, Mirena is better, okay? The, the adverse effect with Mirena, the, uh, the side effects like heavy menstrual bleeding is lower with Mirena. So Mirena, of course, is far better than the ordinary copper IUD. So if you have to choose between Mirena and copper IUD, you have to choose Mirena, of course. Of course, if yeah. it's for the woman, if it's affordable for the woman, because in some countries, Mirena is expensive. So uh, if it's affordable for the woman, she can use Mirena. Of course, it's far better than the copper IUD. Okay? Okay. Yes. You are following a 22-week pregnant woman in the antenatal clinic. Her, her, her epileptic fits are well controlled on medications. What is the most common cause of maternal death? E, sudden unexpected death in pregnancy. E. Yes, exactly. The sudden unexpected death e. in pregnancy. The last question. Pregnant woman with epilepsy have the highest risk of breakthrough scissors during? Postpartum. Postpartum. Yes. E. E. Postpartum. 
Yes, postpartum. Postpartum, that's the right answer. And that's the last question for today's session. Thank you so much for attending the session. I hope you enjoyed Thank it. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Sam. You are most welcome. So, Mafia, are you here? Yes, Dr. Helmi, I'm here. Okay. I'm going to leave you now with Mafia. If you have any question, of course, you can send on the group or comment on the Facebook Live post. And of course, I'm going to answer it immediately. Thank you so much for attending and uh, meet you soon in another webinar, inshallah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Halmi, for this wonderful session. Hello, everyone. This is me, Mafia, the course coordinator so in Mad Exam Expert. Hope you all are well. Basically, uh, your presence shows that you really want to pass your exam, right? But here the question arises that how we can trust an organization? How can you trust an organization? How we can spend our precious earning, whether they are worth it or not? To answer all these queries, here are our candidates who passed MRGG1 with us. You can see that. Amrita secured 80% marks with us. And Madhu is uh, taking our MRCOG2 course also. And Farjana is, uh, Farjana scored 80% marks uh, with the help of Dr. Helmi and Dr. Z. So first of all, our course is starting from 14th October, 2020. It's a three months course. And uh, you, are all, you all are well aware of our mentors, Dr. Z and Dr. Helmi. Other than that, we have the course features which are First of all, we have live session. Uh, you can directly interact with your mentor. And then we have a uh, topic test and you can even have uh, mock exams. You can practice your all the exam uh, here. Then we have session recording. In session recording, if you miss any your live session, you can watch later its recording on our website. Then we have study groups in which you can uh, ask any query with your mentor. Even you can share whatever is in your mind with your study partner in the study group. Okay, here is your gift for attending our webinar. We are offering $1.60 discount for those who attended our free webinar. So what's the procedure? This is the coupon code which you have to enter. So first of all, for the registration, what you have to do is, first of all, you have to go to our website of Med Exam Expert. Then you have to click on sign up. After clicking on sign up, like you have to create your account. Then after creating your account, you have to click on this course catalog. Then, then after that, you have to select your uh, particular course, like MRCOG1 online course, to January 21. Then it will ask you to get this course. You have to click on this, get this course. And then here you will enter your coupon, which is SD5M1, to get $1.60 discount. Thank you. If you have any question, you can ask me. Okay, thank you so very much for attending our webinars. Dr. Helmi, do you want to say anything? Thank you, Mafia. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Hello, webinar. Mafia. Yes, if you have any questions, yes, please. The session regarding yes, uh, the course. I want to ask Yanni if we want, if we're already, already having an account in MedExam. So, you yeah. need to only sign up or what to do? To no, if you have all, no, no, if you have already account, you can use that. What you have to do is you just have to click on that particular link after going in the course catalog. Then you can uh, directly buy the course with the same account. Okay. okay thank thank you. you. Welcome. Any other question? Anyone? Okay. I guess, uh, Dr. Helmi, there is no more questions. Okay, thank you so much. Inshallah, soon there will be also another live session by Dr. Zay. So stay Inshallah. tuned, the announcement for that session. And uh, see you soon and take care of yourselves. Thank you so much. Good night.